When applied behavior analysis tries to change a person's behavior in order to improve that person's life for the better, oftentimes the question is, which behaviors need to be changed? And the answer is the ones that are most socially significant. Hi, my name is Dr. Igor Yurichevich, and this is Functional Analysis of Behavior 1. Let's go. One of the major challenges when attempting to change somebody's behavior in order to improve their life is choosing the behaviors. We want to make sure that the behaviors that we choose are going to have the greatest impact on that person's life. And by this, what we mean is we want to choose socially significant behaviors. Now, the question then becomes, once we've made the decision to, to target these socially significant behaviors, the question becomes, well, how do we identify those behaviors that are most socially significant? So when we assess a target behavior for social significance, what we're looking at, as Cooper, Cooper Heron and Heward mentioned, what we're looking at is to what extent will that proposed behavior change improve the person's life experience? And that is the major question that we're asking for social significance. So in order to break that down a little bit more, we're going to introduce the concept of habilitation. And habilitation, as defined by Hawkins, is the degree to which the person's repertoire, that is their behavioral repertoire, maximizes short and long-term reinforcers and minimizes short and long-term punishers. That is, we're trying to change a person's repertoire so they maximize their short and long-term benefits and they minimize any short and long-term harm. So that is going to be the fundamental basis upon which we build our analysis of what is a socially significant behavior. Okay, so the first criteria that we're going to introduce is known as the relevance of behavior rule. And in, a, in assessing the social significance of a behavior, we should select behaviors only when it can be determined that that behavior is likely to produce reinforcement in a person's natural environment. So a behavior is socially significant if in the natural environment that this person lives in, the places where they normally go, that behavior is likely to produce reinforcement. And so for this question, we have to also know not just how the person behaves, but also what environments do they behave in? Do they go to school? Do they go to work? Do they have to interact with people all day? Do they work more solitary all day? We need to know the natural environment in order to apply this relevance of behavior rule. Okay, so another question we ask when assessing the social significance of a potential target behavior is whether or not that behavior is a necessary prerequisite for a useful skill. So skills are useful in certain environments, but they're built upon other skills, these prerequisite skills. So for example, if you wanna do cowboy mounted shooting, you need to know how to horseback ride first, that is a prerequisite. So if a skill can be identified that has prerequisites that the individual does not currently have, then those prerequisites can become significant target behaviors uh, for change. Another question that we ask is, will the target behavior that we're assessing, whether it's socially significant or not, will that target behavior increase the client's access to environments where other important behaviors can be learned and used? So the behavior not, might not be useful in a particular environment, but it might allow access to other environments. So for example, in this extreme case here, horseback riding would increase this client's access to other environments. It would allow them to travel to other areas where new behaviors can be learned and new behaviors can be used. Okay, another question that we ask is whether or not the target behavior that we're assessing for social significance, is this behavior a behavioral cusp or a pivotal behavior? So it could be a behavioral cusp or a pivotal behavior or neither. So we need to try to identify it because behavioral cusps and pivotal behaviors are extremely significant behavioral categories. So what is a behavioral cusp? Well, a behavioral cusp is a new behavior that sets the occasion to access reinforcers that otherwise would not have been available. So in our previous example of horseback riding, the horseback riding would be a behavioral cusp because that is going to allow this individual to travel to new environments that otherwise would not have been available. It allows them to travel to new environments, importantly, where new reinforcers are that otherwise would not have been available. And a pivotal behavior 
This is a behavior that once learned produces corresponding modifications or covariations in other adaptive untrained behaviors. So this is a behavior that does not allow access to other environments and other reinforcers like a behavioral cusp does. This is a behavior, a pivotal behavior is a behavior that changes and modifies other adaptive untrained behaviors. And one of the best examples of this is the behavior of self-initiation. So self-initiation, that behavior that can be acquired where you initiate actions on your own, such as approaching others, this is an important behavior that can modify all sorts of other behaviors, even simply with the ability to ask for help. So think about all the behaviors in your life that can get modified simply by being able to ask for help. And how would those behaviors suffer if you weren't able to ask for help so that self-initiation to go to somebody and then the ability to, to verbalize, I need help. These are pivotal behaviors that can change an entire range of other behaviors in your life. Okay, another question we ask when we're assessing the social significance of a behavior is, is the behavior age appropriate? So we might be dealing with clients that come from a wide range of different ages. And when we're choosing a behavior and assessing its social significance, we want to make sure that that behavior is age appropriate. So for example, if you are treating a child, a, a elementary school child, the ability to play patty cake might be an age appropriate behavior. However, if you are being approached by an adult, the ability to play patty cake is not going to be socially acceptable. They're not going to be able to find people that will play patty cake with them. So this brings us to Wolfensberger's idea of normalization. Normalization allows us to establish and or maintain personal behaviors which are as culturally normal as possible. So we want to choose behaviors that are culturally normal for that particular age whenever we're assessing the significance of a behavior. More considerations for the social significance of a behavior and when we're targeting a particular behavior for change. When we're targeting a behavior for reduction or elimination, one important thing to consider is what adaptive behavior are you going to replace it with? So if we are trying to reduce harmful attention seeking behaviors, for example, we need to ask ourselves what other behaviors are going to be replacing it? What beneficial attention seeking behaviors are going to be replacing it? So this is known as the fair pair rule, meaning that when we try to reduce a particular behavior, we want to pair it with another behavior that is beneficial that will be adaptive that will replace that particular reduced behavior another question that we consider when we're assessing a behavior for social significance is whether the behavior represents the actual problem or goal or is this behavior only indirectly related to the real problem or the real goal so for example if you are interested in treating non-compliant behavior, if you are dealing with a student that is having trouble in school and they have non-compliant behavior that you're trying to address, that is the actual goal. Lying, which is a indirect consequence of non-compliant behavior, that is only indirectly related. So if we identified lying as the target behavior, that would only be indirectly related to the true target behavior, which in this case is non-compliance. Another thing to consider is whether or not the behavior that we're assessing is just talk or is it the real behavior of interest? So this again is, in, is related to that indirect nature of certain behaviors. They're not directly related to the goal. Sometimes talk is just talk and it's only indirectly related to the goal that you're trying to change. So we don't focus on the talk, we need to focus on the actual behavior. So if we are telling somebody that they need to comply, they need to be more compliant in a school setting, and they verbalize, oh yes, I'm very compliant, I'm always complying, but they're actually not, we need to make sure that we target the actual behavior and not just the talk. Now this can get a little complicated sometimes when the actual talk is the behavior. So sometimes the talk is the behavior. So for example, if we are trying to reduce curse words or vulgar speech, then the actual talk, the actual speech is the behavior as well. 
we need to be very careful in order to identify whether the verbal behavior, the talking, is the actual behavior we're trying to change or is something else the real behavior and the talking is indirectly related to it and hence we need to focus on the real behavior. So the last consideration is what if the goal of the behavior change program isn't an actual behavior? So let's say that a client comes into you and says that their problem is that they don't have very many friends. They want to have more friends. More friends is not a behavior. There is no behavior that is called more friending. However, more friends is the product of other behaviors. It's the product of certain socialization behaviors. It's the product of certain uh, extroversion behaviors. It's the product of a lot of behaviors. So it's up to us to identify that that goal is not a behavior change. And then we focus on the behaviors that produce that end result. So we would focus on the behaviors that can produce more friends, that can produce increased uh, socialization. And we focus on those realizing that more friends, while a noble goal, is not an actual behavior. All right, so that's the end uh, of today's video on assessing target behaviors. We went through a number of different questions that we look at when assessing the social significance of a target behavior. We talked about the relevance of behavior rule. We took a look at behaviors that were prerequisites uh, for other behaviors or uh, allowed access to uh, other environments. We looked at behavioral cusps and pivotal behaviors. We talked about choosing age appropriate behaviors and the idea of normalization. We talked about always having a adaptive new behavior that we introduce whenever we're reducing a maladaptive behavior, AKA the fair pair rule. And then we looked at whether or not the behavior that we're trying to change is only indirectly related to a behavioral goal or also whether it's talk or the actual behavior. And then finally, we talked about what to do when the stated goal is not an actual behavior but is a product of other behaviors. So wow, that was a lot to cover. Uh, thank you for uh, sticking it out with me on today's video. Next time, we're gonna start taking a look at now that we know how to identify socially significant behaviors, the next thing we need to do in order to help our clients is learn how to measure those behaviors. We're gonna be doing that next time. So until then, stay frosty, stay functional, and I'll see you next time. then it becomes, crawling becomes that socially significant behavior that we can, blah, blah, blah. all right, hold on a sec. All right, the next question we ask, 